And this presentation this afternoon at um, Sunday Afternoon at the Museum has been prepared by Rachel Pannebecker and David Kreider. Uh, Dave's going to be giving the presentation to you today. And it's my pleasure to introduce him. So Dave began with a team back in 1985, 1988 to design and build the permanent exhibit that we have here. But when that was completed, maybe you're not aware of what he did, his, some of his travels and where he's worked beyond. He worked three years as a preparator and collections assistant in, for the anthropology division of the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Dave then moved to Florida, where he was employed as a preparator at the Harn Museum of Art at the University of Florida and a, as a naturalist instructor and craftsman at the Morningside Center Nature Center in the city of Gainesville. He rejoined the Kauffman Museum staff in 2000 and currently serves as a museum technician and collections coordinator. Dave designed the installation and prepared the layout for the current special exhibit, The Magic of Things, Five Continents, 25 Centuries, and 125 Years of Collecting. And recently, I also had the enjoyment of watching him teach a religion class and facilitate a religion class as he went through the Mirror of the Martyrs, and I enjoyed watching him facilitate that process. Please welcome Dave Crowder. Thank you, John, and good, after good afternoon, everyone. I'd first like to acknowledge Rachel's part in this program who collaborated with me. Um, Rachel's not able to be here today, but I appreciate her as a longtime colleague of mine, and especially her mentoring me in all things collections. So thank you, Rachel. Our story of collecting begins with the December 1896 issue of the School and College Journal. A short article announced that the students and friends of the college were establishing a museum of natural relics. See, a museum of natural history and American relics. The anonymous authors requested that persons who are in possession of any kind of curious relics or botanical, zoological, or geological specimens, and would like to perform an act of charity for scientific purposes, here have an opportunity to do so. All donations will be thankfully received. The museum organizers had already collected an herbarium, a cabinet of insects and small animals, and examples of minerals and metals. And they noted that an owl caught on campus was being prepared by P.A. Penner, an amateur taxidermist. <laughs> Finally, they acknowledged that the principal part of the museum for the present will consist of a collection of Indian relics presented by missionary H.R. Voth of Arizona. Only one photograph is known to exist from the first 45 years of a museum at Bethel. Published in a 1911 yearbook called Echoes, the photo shows display cases that could be holding perhaps the minerals and metals specimens, or perhaps the Indian relics. The cattle longhorns mounted on the right suggest that someone was collecting items related to the Chisholm Trail, which passed through the campus. The human and cat skeletons they also appear in the yearbook in a photo labeled physiology class. Thus, we have evidence that museum collections were used for teaching. In 1908, Professor P.J. Wadle wrote an article for the Bethel College Monthly entitled, A Museum, a Necessity, in which he made the point that museums, like libraries and laboratories, are essential to a liberal arts education. The Bethel Museum took on a new life in 1941 after Charles Kaufman of Marion, South Dakota brought his personal farm museum to North Newton he, and integrated it with the college collections and opened a new venture to the public which is, became known as Kaufman Museum. Mr. Kaufman's collections paralleled and also expanded those already at Bethel. 
furry animals plus exotic animals in an era where there were few zoos. Here a polar bear and a zebra joined North America deer in front of a landscape that was pa painted by Charles. Native Americans of the Great Plains with mannequins carved by Charles plus artifacts from cultures around the world collected by Christian missionaries. The material culture of frontier settlers, a log cabin, old tools, again with mannequins that Charles created. Technology and transportation from typewriters to motorcycles and even the hearse that we now have in the Magic of Things exhibit. All of this is good old stuff, including the rocking chair on the left, a baby buggy from the 1850s on the lower right, and shelf, a whole shelf full of wall clocks in the background. These photos of Charles Kaufman interacting with college students in the late 1950s are evidence that the collections continued to be used for educational purposes. However, Mr. Kaufman expressed disappointment that few Bethel students visited the museum on their own, even though students had free admission. After Kaufman's death in 1961, the college continued to utilize the museum's collections. In 1968, Daryl Castile, a visiting lecturer with ACCK, led Randall Kaufman, who's pictured there with a pencil behind his ear, and other Bethel students in preparing a new Indians of the Americas exhibit. And in 1972, students assisted in developing exhibits on textiles, guns, and endangered species prior to a visit from the National American Studies faculty team. In 1974, students Bruce Lisey and Myron Voth developed an informational guide and a mini exhibit called Mennonites, Wheat, and Technology. Charles Kaufman had a generous and open attitude toward collecting in this A to, a to Z museum. Everything from A is an arithmetic book to Z is a zebra. The collections grew rapidly in part because Kaufman Museum was the only museum in the county until 1966 when the Harvey County Historical Museum or Historical Society began collecting artifacts. Thus for 25 years, objects unrelated to Bethel College or Mennonites found their way into the collections, such as this shadow box with hair wreath donated by Mrs. A.F. Hazlitt. And you can see that up close in the Magic of Things exhibit. The gun collection from Charles Smith of Halstead also came during that time period. After the end of Charles, the Charles Kaufman era, four distinct collecting directions emerged. And they're influenced by four very different individuals or personalities. The first was John F. Schmidt, pictured on the left, who served as museum director curator, in addition to his primary responsibilities as archivist at the Mennonite Historical Library. Schmidt sought to center the museum collecting around, America, around Mennonite folk history. And in this photo, he's demonstrating a little wooden folk toy to these visiting school children. The second person was John Jansen, a Bethel alumnus and former anthropology professor at Bethel, Jansen initiated collecting artifacts from the, from the Congo in specifically areas served by Mennonite missionaries and MCC PAX workers. Jansen guided Henry Gertz, a Bethel alum and PAX worker who collected ceremonial mass from the Pende people, a project which was funded by the Bethel College class of 1969. And John is here today. Welcome, John. The third person was Cornelius Cron, director of the Mennonite Historical Library. The centennial of the 1874 migration of Mennonites to Kansas 
led Cron to dream of preserving historic buildings to enhance and recreate an immigrant settler village. In 1974, Ernie Unruh and volunteers like Glenn Ediger and flagman John Fast moved the Voth Unruh Fast House from rural Gossel to the college campus. While plans, there were plans for mo also moving an adobe house, a church, and a blacksmith shop, but they were never achieved. But in 1986, the Ratzliff Barn and the Little Huffton style building were added to create what is now our museum farmstead. The fourth personality was Dwight Platt, who's also here today, Bethel College biology professor, and he, beginning in 1984, Dwight led a team of volunteers in establishing a living collection, a tall grass prairie with 15 species of grass and over 100 species of wildflowers. The prairie was one of the main themes of the storyline that led Coffin Museum away from simply collecting and preserving to interpreting key stories represented in the museum collections. The decision to feature select artifacts and specimens in a new permanent exhibit was a leap of faith for many in the museum's constituency. People were concerned about what would happen to the 90% of the collections that weren't included in the Of Land and People exhibit, which you can now see behind us. Here, Reinhill Jansen orients visitors to artifacts which were being selected for the original people section of our permanent exhibit. Museum and staff committed themselves to utilizing the collections by creating a series of temporary exhibitions and organizing mini exhibits on campus and loaning artifacts to other museums. We also developed kits with real objects for hands-on teaching that school teachers could borrow. That pledge to utilize the collections in creative ways is seen in the current exhibition, The Magic of Things. Collecting at Koff Museum in the last 20, 35 years has been guided by two trends that value interpretation. The first trend can be called signature collections. The term signature collection is fairly recent, arising out of the communications and, mass and marketing language where signature is defined as a distinctive pattern, product, or characteristic by which something can be identified. Kaufman Museum benefits from two signature collections that are central to the museum's mission and that have been generated significant historical interpretation. The Martyr's Mirror collection is a joint Kaufman Museum Goshen College project, which was initiated by the late Robert Kreider and Goshen professor John Oyer. The copper etching plates from the 1685 edition of the Martyr's Mirror were featured in the exhibition that premiered at Kauf Museum in 1990 and has toured across the United States and Canada before being installed in our, in our new building edition in 2006, where it is, is its home base for future travel. The second signature collection is the Mennonite Immigrant Furniture Collection, which is based on the groundbreaking research of John and Reinhild Jansen. The 1991 special exhibit largely featured borrowed artifacts. Since then, the museum's investment in interpreting the Vistula Delta tradition has prompted donations of dowry chests, wardrobes, clocks, all priceless family heirlooms. The growth of this collection ultimately led to an expanded permanent display, which opened in a new edition in 2006. Both the Mirror of the Martyrs exhibit and a Mennonite immigrant furniture exhibit are collections which are distinctive, derived from the museum mission, and have been deeply researched and interpreted by scholars. Thus, they are, they are our signature collections. 
A second trend in collecting is linked to Kauf Museum special friends. From the Of Land and People exhibit onward, Kauf Museum has earned a reputation for developing and designing award-winning exhibitions. Our excellence led Friends of the Museum to pursue organizing exhibits based on their private collections. Two of these exhibit collaborations resulted in collection, the cl collectors donating their collection to Kauf Museum. In both cases, the artifacts in the collection did not have deep links to the museum's mission, but both had compelling interpretive stories, as well as potential to generate revenue, as traveling exhibits have become an important um, part of our financial planning. The Reeds and Wool exhibit was organized by collector John Summer and featured the Summer Krieger collection of textiles from the Kyrgyz and Uzbek people of Central Asia. The exhibition premiered here in 1998 and has since traveled to museums in Kansas, Kentucky, and Canada. Kauf Museum again exhibited Reeds and Wool in 2004, and you can look forward to seeing it for its final time here later this fall after Fall Festival. The Better Choose Me exhibition was organized by collector Ethel Abrams, Ewart Abrams and featured her collection of tobacco fabric novelties. The exhibit premiered at Kauf Museum in 1999 and has traveled to museums in Kansas and Virginia. Kauf Museum again exhibited Better Choose Me in 2018 and portions of it were installed in 2021 as a complement to our um, new traveling exhibit, Vapes Marketing and Addiction Exhibit. By donating their collections to Kauf Museum, both John Summer and Ethel Abrams wished to support the museum's work. Both agreed that their collections could be removed from Kauf Museum when they no longer served a purpose here. What are our, are our current collecting priorities and how do we work with processing our incoming donations? As collections coordinator, I'm, I am the staff point person when someone inquires about donations. However, there are many, many people who help in the process. Our advisory collections committee is made up of board members, former board members, and museum association members all of whom bring their own individual expertise about collections. Currently, Mary Ann Eichelberger is chair. Diane Epp is also on the committee. Deborah Ham, David Howery, Leanne Taves, and myself as staff person. So thank you to all the collections committee members who serve an important role in developing our collections processes. And many of them are here today. The Collections Committee, one of the roles, things they do is advise on a collections fund um, which has a current balance of about $5,600. The Collections Fund is used specifically to support conservation projects like the restoration of the Kim Wall mural that was done a few years ago. You may remember the restoration of the Oregon that was done in 2007. It's also used to purchase um, supplies for collections care. A future project that we may, may use funds from that for is to res do restoration work and conservation treatment to MCC medallions that were designed and created by John Claussen in Ukraine in 1922. They're showing the metals are having some efflorescence and need professional conservation care. The Collections Committee evaluates incoming donations by using these collecting criteria or filters for making decisions. And the committee gives preference for collecting authentic artifacts relating to the Mennonites, their European origins, 
immigration to the North American Plains, and with a special um, emphasis on the collection of Mennonite immigrant furniture. We also give preference to the history of Bethel College, its academics, its sports, and student activities. And we give preference to cultures with significant Mennonite relationships through mission and relief work, such as Native American, and particularly the Cheyenne peoples, in Central India, Central China, and Central Africa. We also give preference to Mennonite church history and life, congregational life, history of Mennonite Central Committee, and civilian public service. And we give preference to current courses offered by Bethel College in world civilizations and world religions. What items do we decline? In the past, nothing was declined. <laughs> but since 1985, we are a little more, uh, have more of a filter. Every couple months, I get an email or a phone call asking if Kauf Museum would like a pump organ. And I say, no, we don't. We already have three on exhibit. One here, one in the, the uh, Victorian house display, and one out in the Faust Unruvoth house. And we have another half dozen well-documented organs in our collection. So no. Learning to say no is an important word in collections management. But I also buffer that by helping people find other homes for their objects and their heirlooms. Artifacts are inanimate, so we depend on people to work with our collections. In addition to the collections committee, I'd like to highlight a couple of important volunteers who are integral to processing our existing collections. Diane Epp started volunteering at Kauf Museum in the fall of 2010, soon after moving here to North Newton. And she has processed more than 2,250 artifacts. After the collection committee approves accepting a donation, and it first comes in on a, a temporary deposit receipt, when the, when the committee approves an item, then Diane gets to work. She creates a catalog worksheet like I'm holding here, describing, measuring, and sketching the artifact, and researches the correct nomenclature for the item, and then enters the object into an accession book or catalog. And we just recently started our third accession book, the first one being in 1940 when Kaufman moved his collection and merged it with the Bethel collection. It's a, a paper record of our incoming donations. I've asked Diane to comment briefly on her work and if she has any favorite donations that she's worked with out of those 2,250 items. I've found this a tremendously interesting process over the years. It is always fascinating to see what comes in. And of all of the items, uh, some of the ones that I have found most interesting have to do with particular family items or particular church items. Uh, there is a group of items that we have received over the course of uh, these last years, which have both family and uh, church-related uh, information. And they came to us from the Robert, Robert Kreider collection uh, of items which were given to uh, 
Robert and Lois as thank you gifts for, for their work in Germany after World War II with refugees. Uh, some of them are uh, small handmade uh, Christmas tree ornaments and some of them are larger things like uh, plates that have uh, information on them about particular refugee camps. And so those items have been particularly interesting to me uh, to uh, accession. In addition, there have been numerous items, too numerous obviously to mention, as David said, but uh, everything from a set of uh, stereo uh, photographs for old stereopticon uh, plates uh, from the World uh, Fair in St. Louis in 1904 to more, many more recent things, including uh, clothing that have been made. There's a dress in the uh, current exhibit which was uh, made uh, back in the 1940s. So uh, there's just a never-ending group of interesting items that can be found in the collection. Thank you, Diane, for your role in building the museum's collections. <coughs> Karen Schlebaugh is another key volunteer, and she became volunteering here at Kauff Museum in February 2018 after retirement from teaching piano in the Bethel Music Department. Her considerable keyboard skills are ably applied here <laughs> as she spends much of her time entering the catalog worksheets that Diane has prepared, entering those worksheets into our digital catalog database, and then preparing paperwork to be sent to acknowledged um, donors. Karen is now up to date on entering all of our recent donations, and she's also working on digitizing past catalog sheets that had never been entered with a goal of having all of our donation records digitally accessible. Karen, I originally wasn't gonna be here. She is here in the front row. And how many items you think you have entered? More than 2,250 oh, yes. times four. So you may have entered at least a quarter of our collection has have gone through Karen's fingertips into our digital database. Um, in talking the other day, one of the sp a, uh, memorable item that came across she was entering was a, a suitcase that was made by German prisoner of war, um, a German prisoner of war based, who was in prison at Peabody and was working on a, a Mennonite farm. And that, um, family donated that suitcase um, a number of years ago, and it was one of those past worksheets that Karen was entering. Um, a visible symbol of, of our uh, interactions in this community with World War II experience. Thank you, Karen, for your important work in collection data processing. During this past month and past year, two cherished members of our collection committee have died. And I want to recognize both of those people today. Keith Sprunger was an invaluable member of our collections committee, contributing his keen insight into local and global history, always with an eye to discer discerning which donations to accept. Keith will be missed and remembered. Phil Kuntz was also a loyal volunteer 
who was always eager to help move large objects in the collection, repair the corn sheller, or assemble new portable shelving for our storerooms. Phil's pictured here with a window frame from the 1880 Adobe Bethel Mennonite Church from rural Inman, portions of which Phil helped move into better storage conditions just this past um, year. Phil will also be missed and remembered. At times, Kauf Museum has decreased its collection through the process of deaccessioning. Objects identified for removal could be damaged, have unknown origin, be a duplicate, or don't fit our collecting criteria. Deaccessioning is only done through a deliberate process involving staff and then recommendations by the collections committee. And finally, deaccessioning re requires a unanimous action by the full Cuff Museum board. Examples in the past 10 years of items removed have been damaged taxidermy specimens, like a, a zebra that was damaged beyond repair, an incomplete Grant automobile, just pictured here, and a piano with unknown provenance or history. Some of you may be wondering or remember a plane hanging from the ceiling in the old Kauf Museum when it was in Alumni Hall. What happened to it? Why isn't it here? Well, the biplane came to Bethel during Charles Kaufman's time and when, when the museum was put in storage in 1976, the biplane was returned to South Dakota where it had been owned by the Waltner brothers. And it now hangs in the Heritage Hall Museum in Freeman. Um, I personally saw it a few, uh, a, a month ago. Um, it's worth a trip up to Freeman to revisit that if you remember the biplane hanging here. Where are all of our collections currently? Of the more than 45,000 artifacts, most are in storage, both in permanent and secondary storage. Many are in our permanent exhibits of land and people. And in addition, it features Mennonite immigrant furniture and the Martyr's Mirror exhibit, as well as in the dioramas and displays in the Charles Kaufman room as you go back to our offices. Even more of our collection are featured on the grounds in the Voth under Faust House and the Ratcliff Barn and in the Claussen Windmill, which isn't visible behind the house. And more than 125 artifacts are in the Magic of Things special exhibit. These animals just returned last week from a month long stay at South Breeze Elementary School here in Newton, where third graders learned, used them to learn about the prairie. We also have objects out on loan currently at other museums. Two bicycles are up in South Dakota right now. One, a, a uh, 1880s high wheel bike and also a 1905 Columbia shaft drive safety bicycle. And they'll be up through June when a, a bicycle ride comes through South Dakota with a stop at the Heritage, Heritage Hall Museum. They wanted additional bikes to supplement their meager bicycle collection. And we are happy to oblige. We also here, in, here at, the, at the Harvey County Historical Museum, they have some of our mil miniature buildings of North Newton on display or on loan. Additional parts of our collection are out traveling with exhibits. Artifacts related to World War II or World War I history are at Tabor College presently as part of our traveling exhibit, Voices of Conscience, Peace Witness in the Great War. And two mini exhibits are up at the Newton Public Library and also at the Bethel College Mons Library, 
both featuring additional items that we couldn't squeeze into our Magic of Things exhibit, and we're using them to promote um, coming here to see the full exhibit. Among the hundreds of donated items that have come during the past two years, I'll highlight two new arrivals. During the pandemic, people seem to be thinking about Kauf Museum as an appropriate place for their heirlooms. Last fall, an important donation of tools, supplies, and carving blanks came from the grandson of Gerhard Esau II. Gerhardt was a cabinet maker, furniture builder, and a wood carver, born in 1876 in the Amtracht settlement in Russia. And as a four-year-old boy, he traveled with his parents on the Great Trek and settled in Akhmetchit near Kiva, Uzbekistan. While there, as a boy and then young man, he learned the trade of cabinet making from his father. Later, Gerhardt returned to Amtracht to marry and emigrate with his wife, Elizabeth. In 1905, to Beatrice, Nebraska, where he continued his artistic work until his death in 1951. This donation of his tools and cabinet connect the, Rus the Mennonite immigrant furniture of the Vistula Delta to Russia, to Kiva, and now to the Prairie States. A, don a donation from earlier this spring, which the collection committee has not yet deliberated on and will at its next meeting, is this paint kit from Emil Kim, which was donated by his grandsons, Marlon and Bob. This kit, along with the painted um, doll cradle, will add to our existing Kim collection, which includes the restored wall murals and painted furniture, which are featured back in the Mena Immigrant Furniture Exhibit. Items from both of these recent donations I have up here on the table to give you a little bit of a taste of what came in with those two significant donations. And you're welcome to come up and, and look um, later. And it's just a, a teaser, it's not everything. We are grateful to the families who entrust Kauf Museum with ongoing care and interpretation of their donated objects, such as the recent Kim donations and the Esau donations. And in June, descendants of Aaron E. and Anna Jansen Clausen are gonna be having a reunion here in this space where they are gonna learn about and see dozens of artifacts which descendants of their family, their Clausen descendants donated to the museum in the past. All of their donations help tell the story of Mennonite immigration to the Central Plains. Last month, Martha Schrader, great-granddaughter of Rodolph and Marie Petter, visited here for two days. Martha came from Washington State to dig into her family story, part of which is represented in the rich collection of Cheyenne artifacts contributed by her great-grandparents. In addition to spending time here in our Cheyenne exhibit and over at the Mennonite Library and Archives in a Petter archival collection, she interacted in this room over coffee with friends of the museum who had um, lived in the same Montana community as her family. So making family connections through our collection. What new spaces do collections need in order to survive and thrive in the future? We are out of room to adequately store and access our collection for interpretive study. Our climate controlled primary and secondary storage rooms are full. 
We've create, creatively rearranged to make space for new items, but that is not a permanent solution. We need to actively work to fund additional space for our, for our collections so that we can continue to serve both our donors and visitors. Our vision is to create a collection storage um, area that is open, visible to the public, yet still offering preservation and security. This example from the Arizona State Museum at the University of Arizona features a space dedicated to our own North Newton raised archeologist, Emil Howery. This type of open storage would give homage also to the earlier versions of Coffin Museum, which many of you remember, where everything was on display. It would also allow Coffin Museum to strengthen features of our collection like Bethel history, medical history, our Congo mass collection, et cetera, all of which currently are only on display in temporary exhibits. What should Coffin Museum collect for the future? In the current exhibit, you'll encounter that question posed, and we solicit your comments about future collecting. Put up a post-it note on that wall, or respond to previous postings that have, have already been placed. What should we have ready for our 150th anniversary in 2046? Thank you all for your interest in the history of collecting at Kauf Museum and for your generous support of the museum's commitment to preserve and interpret the artifacts, the specimens, the buildings, and the tall grass prairie that are Coffin Museum's collections. Thank you. I'm uh, gonna put up contact information if you'd like to talk directly to me about a potential donation or have a question about anything today or a question on the history of the collections, you're welcome to, to feed those either to myself or Rachel. I also have a sheet behind John that you're welcome to pick up, which is a one page description of some of our, our collecting criteria that I shared briefly. It goes into that in a little more depth and also a little bit more information on donation process. And I think, Dave, you have some time now to take some questions from the audience. Is that correct? If you have a question, if you'd raise your hand, I'll get the mic to you. I'd like to, for you to wait until I get the mic to you so everyone can hear your question. So are there some questions now for Dave? In back, hold on a minute, please. You said one of the things you turned down was pump organs. What else do you turn down? Um, items that are duplicates and particularly items with no, even if they fit our criteria of, um, which I outlined, if, if they have no provenance, no history, if you buy a, a, uh, a Bible from a, from a general auction or flea market, it's not connected to your family. We don't know whose family it was connected to. That would be something we'd turn down. Or a duplicate kerosene lantern that we already have um, two in, in good shape. Um, so mainly things that don't fit kind of our focus and, and or if there's not clear provenance or history behind it. I have another question in back. What is, what's the criteria for um, being on the collections committee? That's a good question. I wonder if Mary Ann Eichelberger would like to respond to that, who's our chair. <laughs> 
I would say if anybody's interested, please contact me or Dave and stuff because we're always interested in finding who would be interested in doing something like that. Thanks. Some understanding, well, understanding of our collecting focus is helpful, but that can be also learned interest in material culture. Um, but there's not a specific uh, job description. Are there other questions? Oh, right here. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't hear anything. Is this on? I didn't hear anything said about the Mennonite archives. Uh, what kind of interaction is there <clears throat> between Kaufman Museum and the and the archives at, across the street? It's a good question. That. What's the relationship between the Mennonite Library and Archives and Museum? We have a very close relationship. Um, the two days that Martha Petter, or Martha Schrader, the Petter descendant visited, we spent time, uh, as much time over at the archives as you did here, and that was by design. The archives hold more paper materials. We often borrow items from the archives to use in displays here. And um, John Thiessen, the director there, if he feels things that come to archives would be better at the museum, he brings them our way for consideration, and we do the same. Recently, I got a call wondering from a family member wondering if he wanted the discharge papers from a man who served in World War I and had been confined at Leavenworth, a non-combatant non from the Inman area. And I said, Sure, but I will probably share that with the Minute Library and Archives. I went and received it, but then I transferred that um, to John Thiessen. So we have a very collaborative, collaborative relationship, and I think both are important for helping preserve history and to be relevant today. Thanks. You, might, you might also talk about the relationship with Harvey County Historical um, Museum, too. Yeah, we try to be in contact with other Harvey County Historical Society, Carriage Gallery, the, the museum at Goss, the Heritage, um, Heritage Museum at Gossel, um, Hillsborough Museums, um, which have undergone some change. Um, sometimes a, a donor will call thinking an item should come here but when it's really more relevant to telling the story of, of Newton or Harvey County history, and we try to link a potential donor up with Harvey County. And that happened, the inverse happens as well. Other questions? Museums should need to be collaborative and not competitive as we help tell the stories of our community. What would a future signature collection look like? What, what, what would uh, Coffin, what should Coffin Museum collect systematically that uh, is out there. What would a future signature collection? I'm standing here next to the some of the Gerhard Esau items. There's some of his tools, but I have photographs of furniture. So I think doing more research and seeing where some of the existing pieces of furniture that he made are and could those be gathered together either for a special exhibit that would complement our Mennonite immigrant furniture or to add into our collection? That would be part of an existing signature, but would be, a, I think, a dynamic, in, an important subset that would add, it would bring in the whole Uzbek, Central Asia story to that um, broader story. Um, These are all good but, questions. I think we have another one, Dave. Hold on. And the rest so of you find think, way to get to you. If you think of a, a signature collection to think about, add that to the, the post-it board out there. We can crowdsource this. This is a question of the future, I guess. You, as you've said, you're full, but you talk about other things you want. Are there specific plans? now to build more and if so what direction and what comes first and what comes next
we just had a strategic planning meetings and all the results of that are still being processed, but it was clear in, in those meetings that space is, is a need, uh, both collection spaces, as you saw, but also you're experiencing auditorium space needs. Um, we also have crowded office areas. Um, this building was designed in the 80s, not anticipating all our programming, all the educational activities that have developed in the 90s, um, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, so collection space, auditorium space, office space, classroom space. Um, yeah. Our, yeah, our traveling exhibits have um, all developed since the Mars Mirror, 1990, and there are 10 now. All of those, when they're not on the road, have to be somewhere. And that space is here, and we're out of, we're really on top of, we're double stacking, we're, um, there just isn't much more space. And if you go behind the museum, we have some items, there's crates that are important to keep. Um, some were used for shipping the Mirror of the Mars exhibit when it travels. They've been stored in Gearing Hall, East Wing, that's being demolished, so we lost that kind of auxiliary space we had and we're looking for a new um, dry home. If any of you know of a, a good non-conditioned space, but clean and dry, uh, we're actively looking for that. If you drive behind the museum, you'll, you'll get a glimpse of why, that, why we need that. I think it would be safe to, add, to say that the board heard clearly during the retreat and planning session that space is of dire need and they are working on that. Uh, we appreciate the input that many of you have had for that input to help clarify and define how that will be done. Are there other questions? Who owns Kaufman Museum? The, it's a collaboration with Bethel College. We're an affiliate. The uh, collection, the, the building and collections are owned by Bethel College. So I understand the museum is managed by the Museum Association with a separate board um, that we're intertwined. And there's a memo of understanding that uh, spells out how that works, but it's it was done somewhat um, separately, I think as a precaution back when it was put in storage that we would have a museum that wouldn't, that would still be viable without the college input. And it, so having some autonomy gives some independence. I think we would have time for one or two more questions if there are. This has to do with uh, Native American relics or artifacts. Have there been conversations with those nations initiated by Kauffman Museum or by them about what we have and what the uh, feeling is about our having them? We feature a major portion of the original people or the Atlanta people exhibit features the Cheyenne original people and that exhibit was developed with um, Cheyenne consultants. It's not so, it's in the 1980s, mid 80s when that was developed, there was understanding in the Cheyenne community about that exhibit. Um, I think it's important to have ongoing uh, dialogue and talk with, with native groups. For us, it's particularly the Cheyenne. We also have some items um, related to Hopi um, mission work, but a, a smaller collection. So for us, it's particularly the Cheyenne. With the visit of uh, Martha Schrader with um, Petter Connections, her great grandparents started with mission work among the Cheyenne in, in Oklahoma and then moved to Montana. Both those communities have um, active Cheyenne um, communities that, that we are in conversation with, and I think that's important going forward.
Is there a wish list, things you wish you had that you don't have? As in space? Yeah. <laughs> as, as, you know, objects. Yeah, that's a good. With the Mirror of the Mars exhibit, we'd wish that the, um, you know, one plate reappeared uh, about five, seven years ago, but one would wish that the, the uh, Dirk Willems plate would reappear and become part of that exhibit. Um, so you might mention with the uh, Voices of Conscience exhibit, we were looking for things in little light. I'm not sure everyone in the back yeah. heard the question. Uh, Dave, could you re repeat what Chuck mentioned? When we were developing the Voices of Conscience exhibit um, on World War I, Conscience Objectors, there are very few artifacts that appeared, and we put out a call for that. And I, I don't know if people were reluctant to save things from that period because of the trauma, but uh, I guess one wish would be in someone's attic, their um, items related f from, from that experience would, would emerge. Um, siding that still has yellow paint, it was slathered on, or um, a uniform that was brought back unused. Um, But partly, we're not aggressively promoting wishes, partly because we have to f figure out how to store things. I think then, Dave, if it's all right at this point in time, we'll allow time for people to come up and visit with you afterwards. They can also be sure to pick up a sheet of paper here. I have a few other announcements I'd like to share with you. We don't, at this point, have the next Sam uh, Sunday afternoon at the museum date set, but please watch our website. We'll get some emails out and let you know when that does come out. I want to remind you, uh, Rachel has put out a request. She is in, interested in collecting stories of those folks who have had motorcycle adventures. And I know I've talked to a couple of people who came in this morning already who had some motorcycle adventures. I'll make note that Rachel knows about you and hopefully we can get some motorcycle adventures. I think she's trying to get something collected with the, the motorcycle we have here. I would also remind you that shortly, the exhibit Magic of Things will continue to be up, but it will be modified a little bit to allow space for the Car Uncle Carl's camps that will be starting. Uh, I want to remind you that there are some uh, many exhibits that are connected to that that are lo located in the Newton Public Library and also in the Mance, Public, uh, Mance Library as well. Um, otherwise, at this point in time, unless Chuck or Dave, either of you have either further questions or announcements to pass along? I think I'll just yes. emphasize the breaking news is the magic of things is not ending today. Yes. To be up through Tuesday and part of it dismantled and the full exhibit will be reassembled beginning July 1 through Fall Fest. So. so we will have those guests who come for Fall Fest have an opportunity to see the full exhibit. Yep. So with that, would you please give Dave and Rachel in that regard a thank you for, their ta for his time. <laughs> and don't forget that we have some handouts available for you afterwards if you would like to pick some up. Thank you. <laughs>